pretty stuff. Man. Uh, first time I've been able to sport some facial hair, so I'll take it. <laughs> He's all grown up now. <laughs> Sniff. I don't know, Kevin. You just look. You just scare me. I like. I know. He's kind of got. He's kind of got. I don't like it at all. Kind of like a. I, I need something to work on. It's my project since <laughs> nothing else to do. It's kind of got like a New York firefighter feel to it, though, doesn't it? Yeah. Put in a uniform. That's a compliment, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Take the glasses off, Kev. Right, let's see. 1970s respirator for the firefighter. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's not you bad. got good width. If you trimmed it a little bit, it would be a perfect Hitler stash. <laughs> All right. Oh, this is being recorded. Uh, um, <laughs> I didn't. Hey, I didn't place any judgment. It was an observation. <laughs> Can it's, you uh, imagine? It's still not the level of Stu McGill's duster, though. Uh, He's still one of the best no. in the league. That's true. Yeah, his duster is like basically the Sornex like symbol. Yeah. Goals. Crazy, oh, crazy. How many people we got here? Are we rolling yet? Oh, we're up to 30. Man, 30 minute. people want to hear you speak, Trev. Holy. Uh, or 30 people are really freaking bored at week nine of quarantine. Anyway, so why don't we start just talking about the gossip in the field? So Cal State system has announced that they're shutting down, and then the universities are debating which ones are going to have sports. Uh, Concordia is saying that they're going to have no in class um, sessions Memorial. except for labs. Memorial, no in class. Not that anybody cares about uh, that. McGill, McGill as no well. in class. Uh, Sheridan's moving towards no in class. I suspect they will hop on that bandwagon. Uh, any other news? Anybody heard from their American friends? Well, football resumes June 1st. Uh, NCAA football are allowed to resume training. Okay, good. Freak show. And uh, any constraints on environment? Yeah, like I think like they have to take measures and stuff, and it's supposed to be progressive. Uh, I didn't look into it too much beyond that because I really wasn't interested because I think it's a ridiculous idea and it's just going to backfire. And I wasn't looking to extrapolate any of that information into anything I was looking to do, so I didn't research it much. So yeah, Sheldon may be able to speak more about this, but... Um... I know that they mentioned the national and provincial training centers. Those that are uh, part of those can kind of slowly start to reopen or what is, what is kind of the outlook for that in, in that May time? We actually put in a proposal yesterday to the ministry and obviously the report came out. If everybody, has everybody seen the full report? Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, CSIO was actually mentioned directly in the report in terms of just after the NSOs and PSOs. So what we've done as part of the submission report that we had to put to the ministry, we had to actually present what our phased approach is going to be. So they have in possession our phase one. And essentially it is not going to be unlike any of the other uh, institutes. We've outlined exactly what the protocols are. We are only going to have, if you're familiar with the CSIO, it's roughly 5,000 square feet. We're going to have pods of three athletes and three athletes, but again, even things like not mentioning group training because we can't mention things like that. So it's socially or train socially maintained distance during their individual training sessions, but in pods of three. So that's being essentially approved. And now what we're going to do is take the next two weeks. So our goal for the CSIO is actually to be up and running as of May 27th. Uh, but again, it's going to be a hierarchy in terms of priority for the athletes. So AAP carded athletes, athletes that have already qualified for the games and NSO athletes will be involved in the first phase. OPSI athletes or Ontario athletes and PSO athletes will come in phase two and phase three. And they've announced a release for track and field, gymnastics, tennis, badminton, any naturally distant sports they can go ahead. Is that correct? Yeah. I think that's kind of hilarious, actually, that when, it, when track and field was mentioned, I said, I was like, whoever was involved in this decision-making process has never observed a track meet in their track life. Track and field. I've never seen more people and, standing around. Yeah, ever around in groups. Like. Yeah. Crazy. All right, guys. Well, shall we get rolling? Sam, is that okay? Do you want to do a lead-in? No, I think you can uh, take it away. I've, I've made you a host. You can share your screen and right on. Yeah. Jordan and I will try and uh, interject to maybe keep it a little bit more engaging here, Trev. <laughs> Set me up to fail. Thanks, buddy. 
I know, yeah, and uh, I won't be able to see a lot of your chat questions, so throw them up there, and then Sam, you interject with the questions to say, I got a question here, and then I'll stop and ask questions at any time, no big deal. But um, anyway, we're tossing around a variety of ideas. We have about 100 different ideas for this shop talk, and um, one of the ideas we had earlier kind of fell through last minute, and um, so we kind of fell back on this one. Uh, I'm not sure how stimulating it will be, but I'm hoping it gives information to people who haven't thought about this before. So strategic planning when it comes to strength conditioning, we're a bunch of meatheads. We're not usually uh, trained up to be managers or leaders in a business sense. And sometimes we get thrown into these positions and we're not even sure where to start. Uh, as we talked about last week, more and more strength conditioning coaches are starting to be hired in these director roles. And as a director role, you gotta start thinking a little bit different and start thinking a little bit bigger picture. I had this lecture on strategic planning that uh, I actually used for some of our undergraduate education and I modified it a bit. And I come from it from uh, having been in a large corporate setting. So this is shared in college, a university slash college setting, which is very classic um, government funded corporate driven type uh, facility. And also my time in Texas where I worked for one of the largest healthcare systems in the United States with uh, 26,000 employees and $5.5 billion in annual revenue. And uh, in both of these situations, the strategic plan rules all. Everything you have to do has to somehow, some way feed back to the strategic plan. And I'm not sure as strength coaches, we understand what our role is in fulfilling the strategic plan and how we fit as, in as cogs in the bigger wheel. Then on a lower level, I want um, hopefully some strength conditioning coaches to start thinking about, do I have my own strategic plan within working in my environment with uh, the, the space that I'm in? Some of you may be private, in which case, yes, absolutely, you should have a strategic plan. But even in a university or college setting, do I have a plan? So the plan allows you direction, allows you focus, it allows you to bring your staff online with you as to where you're going and why you're going there and you have uh, strategies in place to measure whether or not you're successful in achieving whatever your goals may be. And then even on a more micro level, uh, strategic planning can be used for an individual team. Each individual team can have its own little mini strategic plan built into it. And some of you probably already do versions of this, but you don't call it a strategic plan, where you've established a major goal for the team and then you've broken down that goal into different domains or frameworks that you wanna focus on and objectives within each of those frameworks. And then you're gonna measure outcomes down the road. Hopefully it's a national championship or something like that. So that's perspective I'm coming at with this lecture. So let me just share it up with you here. So it should be there, everybody see? Yep, good. So sometimes you gotta think, where do I fit into the big puzzle? If some of you are in larger organizations such as universities, have you ever looked at your corporate ladder? How do you fit into the big picture? Some of you, if you don't know that, uh, you should take some time to figure out who is in charge of what within your organization so you understand where you fit. Ultimately, money flows downhill from the top of this ladder. Ultimately, if you need money, you have to convince people that you're gonna fit in as part of their plan, and you're gonna be asked, able to ask for that money each year when the budget comes up. Most companies uh, that are large corporations run with the oversight of a board of directors, sometimes paid, sometimes unpaid. Those board of directors are responsible to make sure that the people in charge are actually doing their job and accomplishing the tasks that they have set out for themselves and that you have approved. So board of directors will have oversight over a chief executive officer who is usually a president, whatever, there's lots of different labels for these. And then that CEO underneath it will have a series of vice presidents that will oversee certain specialties. So these could each represent a vice president type role. Sometimes they're called other things. And then the vice presidents, usually under the vice presidents, they'll have a series of directors that will help them to enact their role. And then under the directors, you'll have a series of managers. And then under the managers, this is where you have, you know, different area uh, expertise. So that's, that's kind of us. So as strength conditioning coaches, 
Generally, we are down here. Above us, there's usually some kind of director, in some cases an athletic director, sometimes there's a manager between you and the athletic director. The director then will report to, in a university, it could be a dean or a VP or something like that. And then they'll report up to the CEO who will then report to the board of directors. Most corporations meet quarterly and it's the CEO's job when you meet quarterly to meet with the board of directors and say, okay, this is the timelines we have achieved towards our strategic plan. Here's the proof of what we've done. These are the modifications we've done to our strategic plan and the, the way we're going. Here's the pitfalls we ran into, problems. And uh, the board of directors says, yes, you're doing a good job. You can keep your job and keep going into the next quarter. So most quarters um, run on a kind of a tax cycle. I know at Sheridan, we run on April 1st to March 30th. That's how we run our quarters. I'm not sure how CSI does, but maybe they can poke their heads in here later on and give me some feedback. So now overall, it is the job of the board of directors to make sure this uh, strategic plan is enacted. It's the role of the chief executive and basically these top three layers to come up with a strategic plan. They all will provide input and then decide together. And then also ultimately, ultimately the CEO will say, this is the direction we're going to go. So Sheridan College, of course, does this. Lucky Sheridan, we just spent a lot of money on consultants. Um, they came in and boy, we have a nice glossy. You can go online and download the PDF. It's the Sheridan 2024 Galvanizing Education for a Complex World. They created it and lots of very fancy sounding initiatives. It was amazing. And now, where is it now? Here we are in the middle of a pandemic and we're closing down entire institutions, entire programs. We have no clue how we're gonna enact this plan. Nonetheless, they're still trying to move forward on some of the objectives. I'm sure the board will be uh, accommodating of the change. So overall, what are we trying to do with a strategic plan? Well, we're trying to figure out where we wanna be in the future, and then how are we gonna get there? It's important in most corporate settings that you continue to grow, that you continue to create revenue, that you continue to capture market share. A little bit different words for us because in our industry, especially if you're in the university or in a government type setting, we don't think about that revenue generation too much, but either way, money plays a very important role and you have to think about the money. If you're a private uh, entity, obviously you think about the money a ton and you're worried about where that money's gonna come from. So you must grow and go in the right direction to get where you need to be and to make the revenue that you need to keep your company afloat. There are always people who are trying to take your piece of pie. There's other competitors out there, whether it's at a university or in a private setting. If you do not uh, achieve your strategic plan, bad things happen. If the plan fails, then the CEO goes and then downstream, everybody goes with it. When I was at Memorial Hermann in Texas, the reason I came back to Canada because they were offering me big money there was I started to smell a change in the wind of the strategic plan. When I was there, their plan was to create end-to-end -end patient care, uh, value-based health care, whereby uh, there was a lot of preventative health built into it. And um, by keeping people out of the emergency rooms, uh, we were gonna have a better health care product. Well, the doctors didn't want that to happen because the doctors made money off of people who were sick. And so the doctors managed to chase away um, the president, got the president fired. And when the president went, every C-level executive, I'd say no, not everyone, probably 70% of the C-level, so that CEO, COO, CFO, CSO, they all went away. So my boss got fired, his boss got fired, the boss above him, VP, got moved, then got fired, the new VP that came in got fired, the president was fired. So that's what happens when things don't go to, as planned in your strategic plan. It's important that you keep planning forward and understand where you're gonna go and recognize where the opportunities and threats are. So this is what the strategic plan does. What are the opportunities and threats that exist for your company and how do you manage resources to take advantage of the opportunities and minimize the threats? Anybody know who Kodak is? Remember Kodak cameras, Kodak film? So Kodak was a very, very large multinational co corporation. I don't have the stats on what its revenue was, but it was pretty significant. In the early 1990s, uh, thanks to NASA and some other military leads, they created something called a charge coupling device, also known as a CCD. 
these charge coupling devices were able to collect photons of energy, light photons, and convert them into electronic messages. And this is what is in your digital cameras. In the early 1990s, when these digital cameras first started coming out, Kodak said, their CEO said, this is not a business we're in. We're not in the technology business. We're in the optics business. So optics is taking pictures and uh, putting things on film and developing those pictures. That's what they said. Most of you young guys don't even know what Kodak is now. Where did Kodak go? It went away because digital cameras took over. So the CEO, the board, everything Kodak completely imploded because they didn't respond to the opportunities and threats that existed in the market. If they would have hopped on board, they could have been the leaders in CCD cameras and, and technology, and they chose not to go that route. History is filled with all kinds of examples of companies that go in the right, wrong direction and therefore lose their shirts. Name your crappiest car. So that's basically what you're doing with a strategic plan. What you're doing is looking at the opportunities and threats, looking at what you have as far as what you can do to capitalize on that. And then what you, you basically comes out of a strategic plan is you create a mission statement or a value statement, some kind of overarching statement as to what are we trying to achieve, which is kind of fluffy. I'm not a big fan of mission statements. But then what's important is you create the goals to accomplish those mission, that bigger mission. So generally it's over a three slash four year period is usually what the board will give you. And you have to create these goals and then you have to be able to show how you're gonna achieve these goals. The board will then approve of it. And then you go out and do it and you report back every quarter and say, yes, we're achieving this goal and that goal and this is how. So ultimately, once you've created your strategic plan, what happens is that you have to restructure sometimes the product lines, like what are the products and services that you'd be providing? So obviously in a large corporate context, that's easy to visualize, but imagine at a university context right now, the uh, board of governors and CEO, so your provost, it's likely is, or chancellor in some cases, uh, they're trying to figure out, okay, what is our products now that we're in a state of quarantine and we're shutting down online or in-class education? What are the products we're going to sell? How are we going to sell it? Are we going to be able to make budget for next year? So that's basically what a strategic plan allows you to do. What is it that we're going to be offering? Uh, what are we going to be doing in order to achieve our goals? And then what they have to do is uh, reorganize everything and make sure that all the players are in place to actually fulfill the roles that you need filled in order to achieve those goals. Then within the goals, um, you have to assign uh, committees or groups to focus on those goals and you assign the budget and determine what priorities are and what's gonna happen first and second and when things are gonna take place. So the budget is a big one, right? That's what a lot of you guys are always fighting about when you're in a uh, many contexts that strength coaches are in. You're always, you don't know what's going on above you. You don't know why there's money for some things and not for other things. And so a lot of the time it comes down to how you fit into the strategic, strategic plan as it's observed by the, uh, the people up top. So whenever a company is creating a strategic plan, this is a process they go through. First, there's an extensive research process. Then they come up with this overarching fluffy mission statement and then they create the domains of focus that fall under that mission and then under each of the domains they'll create strategic goals that are part of, that help fulfill the the overall mission within each goal there they're going to have an action plan a budget uh, some kind of a marketing plan for the overall um, uh, strategic plan, how are they gonna promote it amongst each of the different divisions, and then they package it up and they go on their dog and pony show, and if you've ever been a large corporation, you've gone to town halls and you've received these emails, and sometimes there's social media campaigns, et cetera, as part of announcing the strategic plan. So the first step, the research part, uh, if you're in a large corporation, be careful when the cult consultants come walking in. If some of you have been there, if you've ever had consultants all of a sudden show up and the bosses say, oh, here's the consultants, they're just gonna help us create more efficiency in our uh, organization. We're, they're just gonna help us create a new plan and figure out our company's direction. Well, everybody gets nervous when the consultants come in because they are gonna help move the plan, and usually the consultants don't do it without some guidance from the CEO. Usually the CEO pokes them in the right direction, says this is what I want to do. And then if the consultant says, I want you to remove this entire department, get rid of all these people, 
you can say, oh, consultant said we got to do this. I'm sorry, guys. It's terrible, but you're all fired. That's kind of what happens. So uh, Sheridan did a big consultation process. If you go and read our strategic plan, it is quite something. Um, very wordy, lots of words, let me tell you. Lots of words, not sure exactly what they all mean, but they're there. And uh, a consultant created a lot of that and packaged a lot of that up because sometimes your CEOs and all the others, they just don't have time to do the pretty stuff, right? They'll, they'll, they'll move things in the direction, there'll be lots of meetings, but they aren't gonna do the big packaging. But part of this research oh, is pretty important. It's, uh, I've been a consultant on a couple big projects at, in the hospital sector. And uh, the first step I always do is I meet with all the internal stakeholders. So everybody that's involved, that is meaningful. And usually what I try and I ask around, I said, who really gets stuff done? And I, I don't ask who's the ass kisser because you don't get much out of the ass kissers. You gotta ask who gets stuff done because they'll tell you straight up, this is what works, this is what doesn't work. And then you sit down and you interview them and you go over again, what works, what doesn't work and where should we be going and what should we be doing? And then you present this all together in a report with the, the executive and the, you and the executive can sit down and say, okay, here's the feedback I got. This is the direction I think I, we should go. What do you think? But part of the analysis can also involve external uh, parties, so external stakeholders. So this could be uh, obviously customers, but uh, suppliers, contractors, um, um, like if you're in strength conditioning, um, when I did the one consultant job in Indiana, I met with all the clubs that this hospital system had a partnership with. I met with uh, the head coaches for all the, like his volleyball, soccer, basketball, that kind of thing. And again, you get a feeling for who's, who's on board, who's playing the game with you, who's pushing back against you, um, where does the revenue lie, those sorts of things. So that's probably the most important component of your research, but also you should start looking at other competitors and what are they doing? So what's going on in the market right now? And while you're at it, you might as well look at some of the research. In some of our industries, there's certain things that will direct you in a research standpoint. An example of that would be in, say, athlete monitoring. Uh, I was just watching a, a video clip of an organization in the US, a private for-profit sports performance facility, trying to encourage people to give them lots of money to train their kids. And uh, they put their money in some really expensive baskets. Uh, when it came to athlete monitoring and recovering strategies and it was just complete bogus like the research on this stuff is just nothing non-existent you know like i uh, can't remember what the technique was but it makes your cells not be as sticky so it helps you recover faster through this infrared technology it was just complete garbage anyway so go to the research and see what are the things that could work for me moving in a certain direction versus others then you have to talk to, uh, if you're actually offering certain products, what are your suppliers? Can you actually get the product you need? That in our industry isn't that common that we have to worry about suppliers. But overall, the, the research, the goal of the research is to identify what are the major strategic issues you wanna focus on. And components of that may include something like a SWOT analysis. So a SWOT analysis is a little gimmicky, but if you're not sure where to start, and I've talked to strength coaches calmly who've moved into new roles and they're going, wow, I've got a big chunk to chew here and I'm not even sure where to start. Well, you can start with a SWOT analysis. And all it does is it allows you to meet with other individuals and figure out what are the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats uh, to you and what your plan is moving forward. And so you talk with all your stakeholders and say, okay, what do you feel our strengths are? What do we do well? What don't we do well? Where are we following short? What are things we should be doing that we aren't doing right now? And then how am I gonna get my ass fired? You know, what are the things that are going to cause problems for me? Who's going to cause problems for me? What are the barriers I'm going to run into? And those are pretty important conversations to have even before you're hired, especially if you're in a larger role. But once you walk into a new organization, uh, say in a strength conditioning setting, you want to get the answers to these kinds of questions from as many people as you can to figure out what you're dealing with. Then once you've done that, now you know what your weaknesses are. So now you can use your strengths to limit your weaknesses or manage your weaknesses and maybe even turn weaknesses in your favor. And then, where are we, sorry. And then for your opportunities, well, there you go. This could be things I should look at to expand my, uh, my group. You know, you walk in as a new strength coach, they may give you one part-time assistant and two interns and you have to cover 300 athletes, right? 
So how do you grow that? Well, this is part of that process. Once you've done your analysis, you can start strategically thinking, well, then how can I manipulate things to get more staff that I need to do the things I got to do? And then once you have your SWATs done or whatever your interviews or whatever process you want to use and you start narrowing down what are the things we have to focus on, you can go in and do a gap analysis. So the gap analysis is basically a needs analysis where you're looking at um, what do I have now, what do I want, and what, do, what am I missing? What's, where is the gap there? And so within each of the domains, so here's just a little worksheet that shows you how you can think through it. So here's your major domain items, the areas in which your thought process is going. And uh, so it could be, I want to have more staff or inadequate staffing, inadequate equipment, uh, poor athlete monitoring, no ancillary therapeutic assistance. So these would be things that you've identified as major discussion items. What is your current state? So how many staff do you currently have? What kind of athlete monitoring do you need to currently do? That kind of thing. And then what is your desired state? How many staff do you need? How, what kind of monitoring things do you want to have? And so what happens then is you can compare this row to this row, and that's your gap. So what's missing? So I need two more part-timers, one full-timer, and 10 interns. Okay? So that's what's missing. And then from that, you create your remedies. So then how do I go about filling that gap? That's my remedy. And there you go. Your remedies are now your action plan for your strategic plan. This is what the things I'm going to choose from to put into my bigger plan and I'm going to work towards in order for me to achieve my goals. So now you've done your research, you've kind of figured out what your opportunities and threats are, you've figured out where you want to go and what you're missing to get there, you've created some remedies. Now you're going to bring it all together into an overarching, what am I trying to achieve here? What is it that my goal, uh, what is my major mission here? And so if you read mission statements, they put me to sleep. They're, they're all kind of wordy and nauseous, but the idea behind the mission statement is you're trying to capture all the things you're trying to achieve in a very flowery, single sentence way. And so if you look at Sheridan's down here, Sheridan delivers a premier purposeful educational experience spanning a range of career focused credentials that engage students in active learning theory, applied research and creative activities to drive economic outcomes and foster social innovation. Wow, that's something, huh? And, uh, but as flowery as that is, it, once you look at the strategic plan that's been put together into different domains, every one of those domains you can see fits into a certain wording in this mission statement. And that's why you pay consultants lots of money to come up with these things. But overall, this is the focus of where you're going. Then under your mission, now you've created your strategy domains. What is your strategy? What is it? Is it uh, related to improved athlete monitoring, uh, uh, athlete wellness strategy? Uh, do you have a strategy for education and internship program development? Do you have a strategy for um, overall performance enhancement strategies for a sp specific team? So that would be your domains. And usually you're dealing with eh, three to five domains is pretty common. You could always have more, but it just gets burdensome the more you have. It's just, you're setting yourself up to fail. If you make too many domains, you just can't focus, uh, unless you're a really large corporation, it's hard to really focus on those domains. You lose track of them. And then once you've agreed on what those domains are that play towards your overall mission, now this is where the important stuff comes in. What are the goals? What are you going to try and achieve in this next one year, two year, three year plan? So under each domain, you're going to list what are your goals? What are your action items? Boom, boom, boom. List them out. These are the things that we're going to do. And so when I look at a strategic plan, I ignore the mission statement. I glance at the domains, but I just go really focus in. What are the goals? What has to be achieved? Maybe I'm a goal-oriented guy. I don't know. Trev, you might get to this. Um, but some questions coming through in terms of making decisions from a financial standpoint, you identify a huge gap is that you need more resources to be able uh, to yeah. actually accomplish the goal that, you know, the university or the corporate mm -hmm. place wants you to accomplish. And ultimately, one of the decisions typically ends up being, well, you need to create rev, rev gen to be able to then, you know, supply resources to be able to then do what you need to do, which might be 300 athletes. But then you kind of fall into that aspect of, okay, well, now you're spending half your time doing rev gen and not actually like spending time coaching. with the athletes and coaching. So do you want to touch base a little bit on 
that and how that kind of fits into potentially manipulating a strategic plan or a decision where you don't fall into that situation? Great. So that's the next slide after this one, actually. So just hold, hold off for a minute and then Amazing. we're just going to talk about budget. But I'm not sure I have the complete answers and you may not like the answer I give you, but we're going to go there. And then I'd like to even open it up for discussion if you want to. I'm welcoming that. So basically where we are now is we've established our domains and our actions. Our goals or our actions are really the meat and potatoes of what you're going to do. But now what you have to do is understand the CEO has said, okay, here's our goals. And then he's going to restructure or she is going to restructure this little corporate ladder and figure out who's in charge of what goals and domains and actions. And usually what will happen is each of these individuals will have many multiple domains that they stick their hand into and they'll have multiple goals within each of these domains. And if nothing else, especially in areas like uh, that I'm in at university, a lot of it's it's not so much about really creating great revenue or great product. It's more about handing back to people saying, hey, I did all these great things. Look at all these great things we're doing. If you dig down, they really aren't that great. There's nothing really special about it. But as long as they keep going to their bosses saying, hey, we've done these things that fit our strategic plan and the boss can keep stacking this up and showing the, the board, everybody seems to be happy because, again, you know, revenue and some of these uh, government organizations is kind of secondary, even though you still have a budget to meet. Anyway, so now you've got to let things trickle down through the uh, different layers of the organization and establish staffing, who's taking charge, and then the timelines. So the timelines is what quarter are we going to bring this forward to the board and say, hey, we've achieved this. We've, we've done what we've said we were going to do, and we did it in the time you, you allocated for us. So you want to make sure you don't stack up any one quarter with too many goals, or else you just aren't even going to be able to keep track of it. And you'll just become stressed trying to achieve that one quarter. It'll be feast and famine. You'll be really busy at one time and then there'll be nothing to do later on. So uh, you have to think carefully about how you're going to spread out the work over the year. And then what are you going to use to assess whether or not you've achieved what you said you're going to achieve? Is it just check the box? Yes, we did something here. We did something here. We did something here. Or are you going to actually measure an outcome? Oftentimes in most corporations, it's dollars, right? So what is the dollars in versus out? And that is the marker. Of course, if you're a publicly traded company, it's even more complex than that. So now you've got your plan. Uh, you've got your actions. You've reorged. Part of that whole reorg and timeline, you got to start thinking about the budget. So that's all part of the, every step of the way you're going through here. You got to think about the budget. Because your director, if you're a strength coach, you're overseen by a director, your director has a budget handed to them. Uh, then above them, their dean or provost or whoever it is, associate dean has a budget handed to them and then uh, on up the, the chain. And so everything has to work into this budget. So if you know what your budget line item is for your organization and if you can see what the budget is, it makes it a lot easier. I was fortunate when I was in the US, I had full control over my budget, and, but I was given a severe mandate as to how much revenue I should generate. And I knew exactly every dollar that my organization cost, my division cost. And every week I was able to calculate exactly how much revenue we had collected. That's usually in a corporate setting what's going on. At Sheridan, as a program chair for 12 years, never once did I receive a budget in front of me saying this is how much money we have. That's the associate dean's role. The associate dean had a magic number that they were working with and you were never sure where the money was coming from. So it makes it difficult and you as strength coaches at universities, you have probably never seen the budget. Sam, have you seen the budget above you for your division? Yeah, but that's only recently in terms of especially during right now, trying to really identify where money is being pulled from. So I have, but it took me two years to see it. Yeah, exactly. So that's the kind of situation a lot of you guys will be in. So now they'll say, okay, you've created this plan. You have this action. This is great. Um, you've shown your needs analysis. You need uh, X number more staff. You need X amount more equipment. It's going to cost you $320,000 more a year. And so how do you sell that upstream? Well, upstream will say, well, my entire budget is this much, uh, 320,000, I would increase my total budget by 2.3%. 
I will go forward and ask for 2.3% more next year and get this for you. That's what you want, right? Because you're someone that they trust, who's come up with a plan, who's convinced them this plan is worthy. And then they'll go up and they'll ask for that budget. And someone will say, you know what? Yeah, I think that fits in with our initiatives. Uh, our athletics suck. We want our athletics to get better. Uh, we want this to be a big recruiting tool as well. So we're going to invest that 2.3% in your divisional budget and make sure that we can uh, support those kinds of things. Alternatively, now with the situation we're in, you could be facing a 20% cut. In which case they'll come back and say, well, you can do this or we have to find a way to come up with that kind of revenue. In which case a lot of the universities, what have they done? They've said, okay, we can get this stuff done. And they've gone out and found ways to create revenue, which boy, everybody loves. As soon as you say, I'm gonna create revenue at a university and you actually do it, everybody is shocked and amazed because for some reason, the idea of making money in um, the government sector is, is novel. So that gives you power. So I don't know if it's Steve's here, I saw Vicky's here. So I'm assuming at Brock, they've done a good job creating revenue and that's why Steve gets a lot of ear time with probably people above him because he's shown the ability to do that. And so they say he's a problem solver and he can get stuff done and um, it, it's, I can better support this individual because he's doing their part, they're doing their part. Now, is that the best model? You could debate that. And if you guys want to debate that, I'm willing to have that debate here. But bottom line is what you have to rely on is your director being able to convince his boss that a portion of the money that they put into um, their athletics should be spent a certain way. And from this, they will get some kind of outcome. And when it comes to strength conditioning, sometimes that's a difficult argument to make. So Sam, I don't know if I gave you the answer you want to hear, but ultimately there is money, there's a pool of money, and it's a matter of people shifting it around and making it available. And this is where the politics comes in of corporate governance. And so those people who have the greatest say, if you've ever been in a meeting and any kind of meeting, there's always that one or two people who have the biggest mouths and tend to talk most guilty. Um, and so what you need is people who are going to be vocal, but at the same time, get along and, you know, they go out and have beers afterwards and here, I'll support your initiative. If you support mine and, you know, we'll talk to this person who's going to throw some extra money in and we've got these fundraising groups who are going to help us with X, Y, Z. Oftentimes at the university level, what you're relying on is booster clubs and donors. And uh, I'm sure York's not a lot different. And so sometimes you can find those kinds of avenues to give you the money you need to do these things. But um, you want it built into the budget so it's long-term, so it's not just soft money, one-time, one-year money. You want it to be renewed year after year. So I'll give you a chance to respond. Did I answer your question, Sam? Uh, yes and no. I would say, I'd say I'm, I'm interested with other programs, uh, and it was a question that came up in the chat, but I'm interested in programs like you mentioned Steve's at Brock. I'm not sure if he, uh, if he wants to step up and talk a little bit about how that's been successful or not successful, or if he would do it the same way he would, or if now that he's done it and been successful in it, would he choose a different way, or maybe we're perceiving something that isn't true um, at Brock, but um, I mean, he's got a pretty large workforce, which is, is pretty Josh awesome. Ford here. Is Josh, oh, Josh Ford? I think he's doing oh, some stuff too. I'm here too, Sam. Can you repeat that okay. question? Uh, so the question was in terms of trying to create a workforce or show higher up that it's worthy to improve the amount of staff that you have underneath you to be able to service the amount of athletes that they want to service. Typically the response is RevGen. Um, and, and that's successful in some ways and others. And how much does it take away from your athletes being on the floor versus essentially maybe a bit of a process, you know, would you have done it that way in the past? And is that the way that you went about it first off to try and create RevGen to, you know, make sure that the people above you were seeing that you were being successful and contributing to the pot? Yeah, I would say the step one is, um, you know, understanding. And I think in, in the OUA meetings that we had, um, with all the other transition coaches, I think we quickly came to an agreement that you can't have one transition coach by themselves at a university. It just doesn't work well. Um, so understanding that, step one, 
uh, that we all in agreement there, we then came to the conclusion that, all right, what is the ideal model? And every school has a different model, hands down. There's no, there's no one model, but I think we can all be in agreement that any more than four or five teams for one transition coach to oversee and do a good job of coaching is pretty uh, futile. So understanding that piece, I think, was important for me. Uh, at McMaster University, you know, the goal was, you know, initially what we did was we had, uh, you know, uh, close to eight or nine part-time staff that were working with different teams, and I was overseeing their, the programming, but they were doing that, the work uh, with, as, as kind of like the hands and feet of the program. Um, that's really when we started to develop really good transition coaches, to be honest, that are now working, you know, uh, at, at various levels of sport. But um, that model quickly turned into, okay, that's a lot of turnover and, and like different coaches. We then went into, all right, that model of four teams per coach and then started to hire staff from there. Um, you know, where we ran into a bit of a, a stopgap was universities at that time weren't prepared to invest a ton in the transition programs. So we had to do revenue generation in order for me to facilitate a staff. Um, would it be ideal to not have to do revenue generation in order for that to happen? Absolutely, but it just wasn't the solution. So I had to prove that we could – you know, maybe be cost neutral as close to it as possible by generating revenue to offset the cost of, you know, two uh, transition coach salaries of maybe 50, 50, 55, 60 each. And then can I generate 120 grand in revenue by collaborating with schools and high, like lo local feeder schools and things like that. And, you know, there, there, it turned out to be a positive because although we, um, you know, generated revenue to offset the costs, we also brought in revenue generating opportunities in the evenings um, or with uh, local school boards that our student transition coaches and interns got a ton of coaching experience with. So it turned out to be a, a huge positive that way. So um, it was the same thing. Like when I you know, decided to come to Brock, it was the same thing. Brock wasn't in a financial position for me to have myself and three full-time transition coaches working with me. We had to slowly build a revenue generation stream up to the point where now, um, I mean, we're making over 200000 a year where we are in charge of our own our own, uh, you know, futures uh, as far as equipment purchases, staffing, hiring on additional staff, um, you know, but what's interesting is it all depends on who you're reporting to. So at McMaster, my athletic director at the time uh, was a CFO and he just kept upping how much he wanted me to generate to the point where I have never personally uh, stood up, pounded my fist on a table and said enough is enough until I, I lost it on this gentleman. I won't mention names, but uh, I, I have never gotten to the point where I felt like I was a piece of uh, a piece of me generating revenue for a department until he treated me that way. So, um, you know, I, it, as soon as I stood up to him, he stopped. He backed off and, and didn't try to put pressure on, you know, but there are conversations where if you don't make me X, you're, you know, you won't have this staff next year. Uh, until you stand up to, to that type of mentality, I think we we're, we got to be careful. So, I'm now at Brock with our, uh, the, the, who I'm uh, reporting to now um, at a point where they're like, yeah, as long as it doesn't take away from the varsity experience and our varsity development, we can continue to generate revenue, but it's not our primary focus. That's what you're looking for. You're looking for that approach and it takes a pretty special person to, to see that. But um, you know, I, even when I was recruited to come to Brock by Neil Lumsden, that was always the message. It, yeah. We're going to generate revenue to show that you're not an absolute, you know, um, cost to the university and you're not costing, you know, X amount of, of dollars, three, 300,000 K or whatever it is to have a full staff and a center and all those things. We're going to show that you, you know, we can offset some of those costs, but by no means is that our focus. It's always been the message. It's just now that we just shifted umbrellas now to student experience. It's even more of an, uh, a message where, you know, it is part of our strategic plan to uh, have community outreach. Uh, and we're seen as that. And so that's another positive in the light of the president and the vice president. Um, where we have a community outreach to Ridley College, uh, to local school boards, and to local community teams, and we're improving the, the, the uh, athletic development within the greater Niagara region. Um, but uh, I, I agree it shouldn't be at a cost uh, to, our, our, you know, to the experience and the development of our varsity athletes. And that's where it became dicey for me a, a little bit in my previous uh, location was you know, that athletic director at the time um, you know, started even looking at the scheduling and saying, all right, our varsity athletes had to like vacate these hours so we can put more uh, emphasis on the revenue generation with our varsity athletes, uh, sorry, with the community. 
uh, at the cost of varsity athlete training and, and uh, having them come in at five, six in the morning and losing sleep. And that's when I for sure was uncomfortable and didn't see eye to eye and knew that that model would work. So, um, you know, I've been through a, a variety of ADs and, and I think it all depends on who you report to and, and who they report to and just what the strategic plan of the university is. And can you make sure your model fits in that strategic plan to show that you are a benefit to the university and a benefit to the student experience? The more you meet with your athletes, the more feedback forms you get on just how they have, or our interns, of how they're learning more in our internship than they are in their undergrad, uh, in particular to what they're focused and passionate about, the more you send that up the chain, the more they realize that maybe there's something to this, and that's really where we're at now. I'll stop there. Good one. Steve, I'm just going to jump in. Steve um, brought up a really good point, and early on in my strength and conditioning career, I guess career overall, I worked at Upper Canada College. Uh, I didn't really know much about being a strength coach at the time for sure. And, but I had a lot of mentorship from the organizational side. And Steve brought up, I think, one of the best points that's been brought up here today. Know who your supervisor reports to and what they want from them. Because lots of times, you know, you can be frustrated in situations uh, about what you're being asked for. But if, if you don't know the chain of where that's coming from, it's really tough for you to be strategic about your actions and strategic about your plan in what you try to do. Um, the more you know about that stuff within complicated, complicated organizations, the more strategic you can be instead of just sets and reps, you know, um, you can get more complicated and play the, the chess match instead of the checker game. I would agree with that. I would say just to add to that, I mean, you know, not until my management roles in McMaster and now Brock was I even encouraged to look at the strategic plan. And that's something that I would encourage all you know people that work either in private corporation, what is their strategic plan at the university level? What is the strategic plan and how, what do I offer that fits within that strategic plan would be number one. Number two, the ways that I got to the VPs and, and I would just invite them to come to staff workouts and we'd set up staff workouts once or twice a week. And then we would have, you know, we call them the Badger Pack at Brock, but we would have profs, uh, full-time employees, like staff for the university with athletics and recreation, uh, as well as, you know, our, our, uh, our deans all working out together in one room for an hour of a meaningless body weight circuit. But the amount of sweat equity that went into that room and the amount of just interpersonal jiving and fun and, and, and leads to a way better working environment because then they get to know you as a person rather than someone like Jordan says, who just does sets and reps and barbells and dumbbells. Yeah. And that's where you find out uh, Jimmy that runs finances and he helped you balance your sheets or uh, you know, Sally that works in facilities and you're trying to get that thing on the wall for the last six months, putting in work orders and all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden it's done the next day. Uh, we can use a lot of these people skills that we develop in coaching, develop those relationships. But it's important to know kind of where they are on the puzzle so that you're strategic about it all along the way. Um, because at the end of the day, no one really, no one's really going to dig into your programming, uh, right? And say like, oh, wow, you yielded 2.3 more percent on the back squats of men's rugby players. Let's give this guy another 100K. Yeah. I haven't heard of that yet. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I started working out with uh, one of our uh, our financial guys, uh, you know, three days a week, uh, you know, getting to know each other, but also forging like a friendship where, you know, we'll go fishing or whatever. But at the same time, like he was working out with me in our rowing center weight room and was like, man, we need to replace some of stuff. And then sure enough, he went in, I didn't ask, he requested and got 50 grand to, to, to update the weight room. I didn't even ask for that. Uh, and then, you know, he did that for me. And then, you know, also helped me build out our business plans for our sport med and our sport performance, doing things that uh, only Dave McDowell can do with a spreadsheet in order to, to make sure that, uh, you know, we were, we were where we wanted to be uh, moving forward. So, you know, and then now we have a good working relationship with our, our ancillary group and our finance group uh, where we can go in and have shop talks and, you know, Taylor Tisa and I sitting on a dry erase board mapping things out of, of how we want to do things moving forward. It, it, it just works out really well to know those people, not just within sport and recreation, but across your campus. Excellent. Great input. Anybody else want to give two cents on this? I'll jump in here because uh, there's another point that, that ties to Jordan's. Um, can you make change? Uh, I've been in a position before where I realized that the people above me and the decision makers 
um, we didn't see eye to eye anymore and I couldn't achieve the strategic vision that was in my brain um, and that I thought was. So that's another part is, you know, the question you just brought up, Jordan, about, you know, what's your boss and what are they trying to do and what are they trying to achieve? That's very important because um, you also have to realize and even comes down to getting a job and looking at these interviews, um, does that align with you and what you're trying to achieve and what you believe in and your personal goals and your ethics and all those things? Um, because you may be in a job and, and like you said, Steve, uh, ADs may change and all that stuff may change and you may need to reevaluate your position, your role, your beliefs, all that kind of stuff. So it's definitely something to consider because I've parted ways with a job over all these reasons we're talking about. Anyone else? Uh, just to add to what Chap said, I mean, I've had colleagues that have taken jobs in pro sport uh, or even at uh, sporting institutes where they didn't, um, you know, they were brought in to do a role, but they didn't realize they'd have to do this and this and this on top of it, such as revenue generation. It wasn't part of the discussions. And then when they started to try and put together the pieces between the medical department, the transitioning department as to how uh, congruent they wanted all these processes to be and, and, and to have a similar uh, approach and talk philosophy and principle, they quickly found out that they didn't have meshing principles and philosophies. And then it was a year of, you know, not enjoying their job to the point where, they, you know, one of the parties had to resign. So uh, I think it is important to say that for young transitioning coaches out there or even just people applying to different roles, you know, an interview is a two-way street. They interview you, but then you've got to ask a ton of questions at the end of it. Uh, and there's, you know, you've got to show that you've done your research, but it just makes sure that this is, you've got to ask those philosophy questions to a certain extent to make sure that this is where you want to work and, and that it's going to work. Um, and your failure to do so sometimes ends up putting you in a position of compromise that, you know, isn't easy to, to work in and, and also isn't easy to get out of. So just do your homework and make sure you ask the right questions when it's your chance to interview them. Steve, you just made me you just made me think of something because I've had a handful of interviews at different places since I've been working at, at Guelph. And um, you know, I think asking those questions and trying to relate back to either the athletic department's um, you know, mission, vision, values, and or that of the university is so critical. And what I have found often, and this speaks to the quality of leadership, is the people that are um, doing those interviews and, and involved in the process often can't actually connect and, and have a really good answer, right? So then you know, so I'll ask really specific questions like, you know, you're on your website, you state, you know, one of your core values as X, can you give me an, a specific example of how your department supports that value? Uh, you know, is it part of the evaluation process and performance planning process or, or whatever it is? And people really struggle because I think, uh, you know, Trev alluded to this earlier, the, I think it's really critical to have all those pieces in place as an organization. But when you get to organizations that are as big as universities, there's often multiple layers, right? So like, you know, we have a tagline at Guelph, improve life. And then we have, you know, uh, so we're within student affairs. They have their own mission, vision, values. Then you have athletics, mission, vision, values. Uh, we Actually, we don't have some of those things. And then you have, um, you know, we have our five Griffin values that kind of just float around as part of the university. And then so we, even within our own unit, we created some of those things. And it's trying to, it's when they don't align that you end up having some, some big struggles. Um, so I think within the bureaucracy of large organizations, that can, be, that can be really troublesome. And the organizations that do it really well, I think, are the ones that are able to connect sort of, we'll use the term vertical integration for lack of a better term, but be able to connect each of those layers and units and departments uh, and support people and understand sort of, you know, how they, how they connect across campus or a large organization. Well said. To tie in some of these things, I don't know how much more Trev has, and maybe we're railroading it, maybe not. Um, de depending on where you are in your career, I think this needs to be looked at differently. Do I think the backbone is understanding the strat plan, understanding who's in what position, chains of command, all that kind of stuff. Um, my feeling and the recommendations that I've given to people in the past, and I want to tie this into what Chap said is why I'm saying it, is that early on in your career, like find a good fit where you can do 
what you think you can control a lot and gain experience in that. So, so probably coach like sets and rep stuff. And, and then you're going to try to find a place where you can create and push and move some of those bigger change pieces and have more of an impact. And then eventually to tie into something that Dave McDowell said, I hope he's still on here to me a while ago now, at least five years ago. Um, he said, and then you're going to look for the job that comes after you because you are what they want for their strat plan and not vice versa. And uh, I was just reflecting on this a lot. Well, yesterday, for some reason, when I was walking the dog, I was thinking about it. I don't know why. Um, but chaps made me remember it again today as far as you get into those positions where you decide that you're going to try to push change is making sure that you know why you're doing that. And are you doing it for you or are you doing it for the place or the people? Is that what's best for them or is that what's best for you? If it's not best for them, you should shove off and go somewhere else. Uh, that's my opinion. And also, what is the rate at which they are ready for change? Um, I was in a situation at a previous employer and um, by my time back, I would probably do the same thing. That's not necessarily meaning that it's the right thing, but it was very evident in the end of it all that I tried to push change at the rate that I wanted it to change, not at the rate at which that organization was ready to change. And as a result, it ended up probably being a bad thing for everyone involved. So keeping all those things in mind, uh, depending on what you want to get out of it and what the stage of your career is, um, that's why it's kind of necessary to fall back on uh, what Trev was saying right away of, of have your own strat plan and have a strat plan for your career and the different stages, years one, two, three, five, ten, and they become different. Um, and, and then that can be a little bit of a blueprint of what your tasks and actions should be within that strap plan. The only thing I, I, that I'll add is it just made me think when Steve was talking about asking questions, one thing that I found in the interviews conducting when I was here at Sheridan or anywhere else lately is the amount of interviewers that don't ask questions at the end of the interview. Um, and hopefully this conversation sparks some, some specific questions that you might, might wanna start asking if you're not very good at asking questions at the end of an interview, um, because uh, it shows that you're actually engaged in, and taking a look at what's actually going on in that organization. But one of my, I would say one of my biggest pet peeves is when people don't have questions to ask at the end of an interview. And, I think some of these questions could, could probably help you go a long way in terms of getting that job. I lied, I'm coming back. And then, because I've given this advice to people that I've worked directly with, but I think it's pretty good advice for other people. If you're early on or you really need a job, remember, the goal of the interview is to get the job offer. It's, it's not actually to find if it's a good fit for you. Once you get an offer, very few organizations are going to pull that offer. It's, it's complicated. It's a lot of work. So then that's when you pull your tough questions, right? You can pull, and, and it's, it's easier to have guts over email anyway. So that's how you pull out, like, you know, how do I fit into your mission, mission, uh, all that kind of stuff. Where, where do you see me in one, three, five years? Is there room to grow? What are the PD opportunities? All that kind of stuff. And, and it's up to you and your self-awareness and your awareness of the situation to determine, um, do you have much capital in that interview or are they kind of flipping the coin between you and two other people? If you feel that's the case, get the job offer. If you really need the job, get the job offer and find out if it's a good fit. If you're happy where you are, but looking uh, and seriously, then it's a little bit more of a conversation. Uh, and I don't think that's being deceitful or anything like that. Um, it, it's just being a little bit strategic and, it's kind of, I, I'm sure down the road at some point, Trevor's going to do the, the resume piece um, as well. But there are, there are skills and strategies to getting, um, kind of getting what you need and getting what you want along the way too. And in, in my opinion, that's kind of opinion and experience, I guess, is all this is, is that if, if you know that you're going to go somewhere and do the best job that you can and you're a competent, good professional, then you're doing it for good reasons and you can do so with integrity um, because a lot of the times the decision makers that you are facing 
in order to get a job, they might not know the nuts and bolts of how to hire a good strength coach anyways. So if, if you can, if you can stand by the product that you're going to put out there, um, do what you got to do to get the offer at some point in your career. Deadly. Anybody else? You'll still be, uh, we're doing decent on time. I only have three, three more slides. So um, I'd like to circle back on some of these points and just open it up to start the people to start to strategize as to their own careers, what to do within their own facilities, within their own businesses, perhaps. But just to understand when it comes to money, everything, every time a penny changes hands, it's a negotiation. Everything's a negotiation. And there has to be, uh, if you read any books on the art of negotiation, there has to be value on, in your favor in order for you to be able to negotiate things that will help you. And so you have to figure out, is there value in your favor? And then similar to what Jordan said, if you're in an interview, if you're desperate for a job, then you better not be too picky. But if you already have a job and you're shopping around, then yeah, you can, you're in a, a great position to negotiate. And so if you're negotiating and they're not coming around to you, you're facing one of three situations, all of them difficult. One, there's absolutely no money, which in the next 12 months or maybe two years, that's the situation for everybody. Uh, in our industry. So you got to start thinking, okay, um, what, how much, uh, how much of a hassle am I going to be for my bosses by pushing these items? If there is absolutely no money Two, if they're not achieving, then is it your value? Um, it, you may have not outstayed your welcome, but they've become complacent with you. They do not see extra value in what you do. They not, do not feel that you're bringing to the table the things they need to get ahead in their career. So this is your directors or whoever it may be. And uh, therefore you have to start maybe shopping for alternative uh, careers or other locations to go. Sometimes what will happen is, uh, especially in environments like at universities where you have sometimes lifetime jobs, they're trying to push you out, right? So if they're not happy with you, then they'll start making things difficult. All of a sudden your office space goes away and all of a sudden the number of part-timers goes away and they ask outrageous things of you. And so that's a big warning sign. And then the third reason why you may not be able to get the money isn't you, isn't the money, it's your boss. Your boss has pissed everybody else off and nobody wants to support them. And so in that case, you better find some other friends. And uh, that doesn't mean changing your location, but that means starting to look around the organization and getting a feel for what is going on above you and then securing your place such that if a transition occurs that you're not going to be bumped with it. So those are little tips I would have. Anyway, if we're ready to go forward, so where do, where do we go? So we're talking about action plan. For the action plan, make sure you have your staffing in place or your, your, your corporate structure in place to action the items. You're going to have a timeline for it. You're going to have outcomes you can measure to say that you've achieved whatever, whatever it is. And then you got to deal with the money side of thing at all stages. Money doesn't come in after that. The money is at all stages to make sure that you have a strategy to achieve your actions and that there's money available for it or else you might as well not have this conversation at all. Then usually in a corporate setting, these next couple of slides are more larger picture, but it could also be smaller settings as well. There's the marketing piece that goes on. So marketing, if you're looking at large corporations, they'll sing it to the stars. We have this new strategic plan. If you remember Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, they'd get up and they'd do their yearly presentations in front of the big screens and there was a big media circus around it. That was all part of the marketing of the strategic plan. Well, in our settings, usually it's a little bit more subtle. At universities, uh, we come out with our little booklets every year. And then what you'll see is a bit of a dog and pony show. There'll be town halls and, and things like that. They'll go to each faculty and have meetings and they'll present it. But on a smaller scale within, uh, say you have a smaller business that you work in or within your own strength conditioning setting, you gotta get buy-in from everybody around you, right? So it's no good having a strategic plan if the people around you don't know what that plan is and how they contribute to it. And so when it comes to marketing, your role is to make sure everybody who works with you that can have influence on this plan knows what the plan is, is bought into it, is okay with it, understands your strategies, and then when they come to you, um, they're able to discuss this plan and how they're contributing to it. If you get a lot of pushback on the plan, which sometimes in some settings, uh, especially, you know, again, Sheridan, it's a unionized environment. 
faculty have all the control in the world. No one's going to fire a faculty. You just get a lot of pushback and belligerence. And so, you know, those situations, you, you know, if you're in a unionized environment, you're kind of a little bit pickled, but then that's when you start doing the whole glad handing and start having good adult conversations and, you know, currying favor to get people on board and play that political game. But in most of our strength and conditioning settings, it's just a matter of making sure your staff is aware of what you're trying to achieve and why you're trying to achieve it and what the outcomes of that are gonna be. And then you got to package the, the whole deal. So if you're dealing with a corporate level, you're going to have an entire document that uh, could be quite thick and heavy. It could be 50, 60, 100 pages. I just created one for a company that was 100 pages. And um, you're going to hand it to the executive and you're going to hand it to the board and say, here's what we're going to do for the next four years. And um, that's a big chunk of uh, literature, but not everybody's going to read that, right? So you're probably going to need an executive summary. So a little front page, back page type thing. Usually it comes with a flyer. So if you see here on the right, you know, usually on the front, you'll have this very colorful, maybe a Venn diagram or something, something catchy with your mission in the middle and then all the spokes of the wheel that connect to that mission. And then on the back will be your executive summary. So this is the one flyer that you can hand out. You can post it on the uh, lunchroom wall, that kind of thing. And so that people are constantly reminded of what are the themes, what are you working towards? And then of course, you're gonna have your PowerPoint where you're gonna go door to door and give your presentation. So you'll have to present to the people above you, you'll have to present to the people below you, and you'll have to present to the people in line with you in similar types of roles. So everybody knows what's going on within your area. So, uh, you know, this is spreadsheet 101 stuff, folks, and I've done this many times. And so I just I put this together in like two minutes uh, just earlier. And uh, so imagine in your Excel spreadsheet here, you're going to have your big mission. So you can verbalize that here and you can obviously make the columns wide. I just want to make sure it fit in, fit my screen. And then here's your major strategies. And then here's the actions within each strategy. And then for each action, you're going to put the leads in the timelines, the costs and how you're going to evaluate outcome. And this is how you keep track of this stuff. And then you're always looking at this outcome and timeline box. Each month when you meet with your staff, you're saying, did I achieve this? Are these in match? Because then when you go to your boss and say, look at all the stuff I filled in. This was all empty a year ago. Now it's all filled in. I did what you asked me to do. And aren't I a great person? Give me a raise. And so just I threw this together um, just yesterday because I thought it just gave you an example of how you spread around the load. So here's your mission. Let's say I wanna be, my company wants to be a leading sports performance service provider in the greater Toronto area. You've identified some strategies you wanna use in order to do that. Yes, of course, you can just do the, uh, put a sign out and hope that people knock on your door, but that's not a very good strategy. So what you've decided is four different routes you wanna go. One, you wanna establish partnerships with all the sports clubs and you're going to go to the sports club and say i'm going to provide all the uh, sports performance service for you you're going to include that as part of the membership of all your members and for that in return i'm going to train all your elite clubs three days a week for an hour and a half and uh, it works out to ten dollars per member they have 1200 members there gives you um, um what is that twelve thousand dollars in order to provide the uh, training for that club and you say, I'll train um, your top four teams for that price. So that would be an example of one strategy. And then so your action for that is you're going to go out and you figure out who all the sports clubs are and you're going to create a product package and a communication plan in order to sell this to it. In within your organization, you have a group that's involved in sales, someone who's that person. So it makes sense that they'd be the leads in taking that uh, forward. And then you'd have, let's say this is the end of the uh, second quarter uh, is the due date. And then the next strategy to for, develop a referral system with local orthopedic surgeons and sports MDs to get referrals for return to play um, therapy uh, within your facility. You have a physiotherapist that works within your facility, pretty common in our environment. So here's the action to go out and find the physicians, create a physician kickback program so that there's a quid pro quo for anybody they send you, those kinds of things. Uh, maybe you want to um, reach out to local schools and get your face in the door at high schools and that kind of thing. So you're going to create an at-risk youth after-school program that's free for at-risk youth. Uh, you get a grant to run that through the Trillium Foundation. There's tons of these kind of sports and rec grants that you can go out there and get. 
and then you get into the schools and you market it to guidance counselors, da da da. And so you have a certain coach that has an in with some high schools already who said that they'll take a lead on that. And you, you know, this is more of a long term. You're looking at um, third quarter of, of this year. And then uh, your standard direct, uh, improve your direct marketing to athletes that are with, within sports clubs. So you're going to go out and actually purchase uh, contact lists from these sports clubs and create a direct marketing campaign whatever uh, social media whatever it may be so that's an example in a small business setting obviously we've gone over a few corporate examples as well but this is interesting i reviewed a paper for the uh, journal strength conditioning research last year where they were actually presenting on creating uh, a sport specific strategic plan and so um this was a little flow chart they came up with the sport was actually fencing of all things so what they determined was there was uh, technical and, and tactical aspects of fencing that uh, they wanted to maximize. And so within that, they created the major performance determinants of that sport. Then they determined what are the physical qualities that fit into each of those performance. What is the outcome they're going to measure? What's the test to evaluate those? And then what is the actual implementation plan or action plan? How are we going to go about improving each of these things? So just on the micro level you can apply this kind of planning at any stage of any athletic group you're working with this could be created for an individual it could be created for a team it could be created for your organization and then obviously on up into large-scale corporations so understand i'm hopefully uh, like a lot of you this you're, you're already quite familiar with this but some of you i'm sure you're not is that when you're in a corporation understand where you fit in uh, what, what is the plan there? Where do you fit into that plan and how can you use that plan to do good? At Sheridan, part of our strategic plan this year was to create healthy communities. And part of that was to reach out to the communities to improve the health of members of our community. Well, shoot, isn't that nice? Because for us, it's really easy in a strength conditioning world to say, hey, we're gonna reach out to athletes and give them a place to train and provide athlete training programs and da, 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 da. And we send that up the chain and everyone's going check, check, check. All right, that looks great, do it because it fits the strategic plan. So if you're in a smaller organization, though, go through some of these steps, go through some of that research process and come up with your two-year plan, your four-year plan, and figure out what are the best ways to get there, and then understand you gotta be flexible with this COVID stuff, obviously, that will change your plan a little bit. And then within a, 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 on the micro level, within your own coaching context, how are you gonna implement planning and strategizing and actions within your individual group context and how will that help you drop the mic there you go who's asleep oh everybody turns off their camera so i can't see who's sleeping so now it's open mic time joe do you want to start joe you said that you were working on your master's degree in this stuff what's going on with you no i i uh i'm i'm in the process of putting together like um an athlete development model. Uh, actually, Chris gave me the advice to do so. Um, some of this stuff overlaps with with what I'm working on. Um, but, you know, working for a pro club, a lot of this stuff is out of my control. I was going to actually ask that question because in my setting, um, I don't know about revenue generation. It's not something that uh, is an option for me to go about things. Um, it's a little different, but no, I think what you presented was really helpful and, and I try like being at a club now and seeing how they try to align everything pretty well and it's important in every organization to be that way. Um, but just how, how important it is to bring things back to the core values and making sure that you align yourself and what's going on uh, with everybody above. Um, no, I'm doing a master's in technique change and skill acquisition. So oh, okay. a little different than... I, I thought, I, yeah, I, I knew you were doing your master's and I knew you were working on a strategic plan. I put those two together. Yeah. Anyway, who's left? Who wants to throw in there? Tell me about a strategic plan that you worked within, if it worked, if it didn't work, or something that really went down that was crazy. I finally can see some of the chat here. That's, you guys are having good chats. So what I have I some people to pick on here that I know have done this, actually, and I, I want to know the information. So I'm going to ask the question. Similar to what Trev said, um, how the following people, I'll name them last so that like five people don't start trying to talk. How have you learned about this? Um, there are a number of you on here that I know that I, 
I've either worked with or just know what you've done or think I know what you've done. And I know that you've accomplished these things. So how did you learn it? Did you have any mentors in the area? Did you just read random business books or, or, or whatever? A um, couple of people that I'd like to hear from if they're willing, Darren, uh, Dave McDowell, Josh, Chaps, and then a guy that's newer to it all, but my understanding is this is kind of his job is Taylor. Um, so where did you learn about these things? And then also how did you, what were some links that you used to apply your prior learning and prior training, prior training as a coach to put some oomph behind these ideas? Hey, I'll jump in if no one's going to talk. Um, my uh, first bunch of jobs in our industry were um, all government-based. I worked at a sports high school. I worked with Steve at Mac. I worked uh, for the Canadian Sport Institute. Very top-down models, so I learned from all my mentors at that time. But uh, Sheldon, who was on here, was one of the only guys I knew who was running private business stuff. So I always went to him first. I started personal training before anything and I created a sole proprietorship when I moved to Toronto and I learned all about being a business on yourself and invoicing and the whole tax game taxes is just a game of snakes and ladders how much can you write off um, experience is a lot of it but I leaned on Sheldon a lot as much as I could um, fast forward to now I work for a startup tech company and if you want to expedite your learning on all of this stuff, work for a startup. I've had someone tell me at Christmas that I've got an MBA's worth of knowledge uh, based on the conversation we had, based on what I've learned. Um, you want things to be as fast and agile as possible. So it's funny, the tech world, engineering and um, developers use essentially periodization. Agile uh, development is working on sprints, which are actually weekly microcycles, and then those add up to achieve a certain goal, which is your mesocycle, and then you add up the mesocycles to deliver product updates. So essentially, developers and engineers work in that, but the, the biggest thing I've seen in that world is how agile things can flip. So for example, when COVID happened at Push, you know, we know we did a, a market analysis. We know that um, I'm just throwing out some numbers here. 20% of businesses from pro, that's going to be depressed. We know that 30% is from NCAA, that's going to be severely depressed. So what markets are going to be open and where can we shift our developmental focus to try and bring in revenue so that the company can survive uh, onslaught? So in the private world, um, all that matters is, is revenue because that's people voting that they like your product with dollars. Um, now, some businesses unethically uh, get those dollars through marketing and through other means. Business ethics is a whole other conversation that as a strength coach, uh, you know, I've, I've carried strong ethics. I've left two jobs over ethical reasons. Um, going to the business world has been a super fascinating one on that aspect to make sure that our marketing is authentic and ethical. Um, but it's, it's been a crash course sitting at what Trev called the C-suite level. I have a director title, but I sit at the C-suite table, learning all of this stuff top to bottom. Um, I was the oldest person in the organization for three years. So I, I, was, I was the granddad, and that was the biggest crash course in this stuff. So um, lots of mentors, seeking out people who were doing what you wanted, and then throwing yourself to the wolves would be the three ways I've learned this. Sure, I can, I can try and chime in here a little bit. Um, I had a bit of an interesting uh, experience the last few years. I've actually been kind of, it's, it's interesting. I know Trev and a few of you know about this, but uh, I've kind of lived the reorg. So I've, I've probably the last like four or five years, I've been watching our department kind of go through this transition. Um, and it's kind of funny to hear about, you know, the changing of athletic directors because that basically is kind of exactly what happened. I spent many years at UTM uh, kind of developing a career for myself. And it's funny seeing Fez on here because Fez is someone that I work with. Um, but uh, when I got my full-time like permanent position doing strength conditioning at UTM, 
they basically announced the reorg was happening pretty much right after that. And then the, the, it was within a month that our previous AD was retiring. And then, so for the last number of years, we've been kind of going through this process of seeing them develop their um, strategic plan. And, and um, I'm not really sure how much insight I can really give into how I kind of navigated this, but I managed to survive the reorganization of the department. And um, I learned a whole bunch about what that process is like. And just like you said, like how you fit into that process and how much change you can ultimately make. Um, I definitely leaned on Trev and Sam and everybody for advice uh, to try and help me kind of navigate that process. But um, uh, now moving forward, it's going to be really interesting because in the last two years, we've had five athletic directors and now our latest athletic director has only, hasn't even been here for six months. And, and now she's in charge of, of, of navigating us through this COVID change. So um, it's really just about relationship building and trying to make sure that you're offering something that is of value to the university. And I've had to be as agile as I possibly can to try and make sure that whatever services I'm trying to offer are, are meaningful to not only the RC program, but then also the student body at, at large. And that's a really difficult balance to find. Um, and uh, I've also worked with a swim program for a very, very long time. And that was kind of my revenue generation side to help try and support all of the um, varsity programs and things like that. And actually, I'll tell one kind of funny story and then I'll, I'll let it go. Uh, we hosted the, uh, the national championship for Olympic weightlifting and Trev was there. And, and we had a couple of athletes competing and one of them did pretty well and, and one of them struggled a little bit. But um, two weeks after that event was done, I, uh, I ran into the Dean of Student Affairs and he congratulated us on the competition. And then immediately afterwards, he just said, I, you know, I just want to make sure that you know, like, I really appreciate just how diverse your Olympic weightlifting program is. And he didn't speak of anything of the athletic accomplishments of any of the athletes or anything like that. The thing he appreciated the most about the weightlifting program was this, the diversity of people that were within it. So um, just kind of like a perfect example of, of how some of our administrators don't always value the same things that we do. So. Um, uh, it's, and that's actually funny because that's how I end up getting support for my WIP program on an ongoing basis. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's all I got. Isn't it nice when people actually tell you what they want? It's great. Um, one quick thing to a shortcut into one of the things that Chaps recommended and then we'll call on, uh, Dave. One of the, uh, I don't pretend to know a ton about the business stuff, but what I, uh, I guess inadvertently have done is look at the business res, uh, resources that private sector coaches that I respect recommend. And it just kind of like gets me to step two of being, uh, of having some integrity with that process. One of the ones that I really like is um, Eric Cressy's business partner is named Pete Dupuy, I think. And he has like a newsletter and a website. And I just signed up for it and I get like four articles every week, I think. And they're usually like business related, but all about how to run a business when your number one priority is to deliver a good product and, and make money. So that's been kind of like a, there's, if you look at some of those private sector coaches that are doing a pretty good job, Eric Cressy, Mike Robertson, uh, Joel Jamison, like I'm, I'm not really in that scene looking much more, but those are some ones that I jump on when they post business articles. I usually read those because I don't have to vet it as much. Um, so it's a little easy way to do it. Dave, are you ready to give us a little bit of advice, even speaking back to how you would have navigated the, um, I forget what it's called now, SST days, and how you use those skills now in um, in the collegiate sector? Yeah, I mean, um, I guess, like, for those who don't know, I worked in private for probably nine years and kind of worked my way up from, like, being a part-time sort of whatever to I actually ended up being – in charge of all the athletic training for the whole franchise by the end of it, whatever that means. But I mean, um, being involved in the private side, I mean, sales is something you deal with every day and, and we have a lot of trouble asking for money and um, sales is just like trading value for value really. So, I mean, that's an important piece to remember. You're selling every day, regardless if you're exchanging money on either hands, right? So you're trying to get people to 
buy whatever it is you're trying to give them. I think what's important to know is when you're, when you're working for someone, you can learn as much what not to do as what to do. And, and Jordan's going to laugh, but just anybody who knows sort of um, where I came from, they're going to, that's going to make a lot of sense to them. So you kind of learn the ways that you might want to interact with people. If you're trying to get them to give you money, you learn the ways that you might want to develop relationships with different organizations or the ways not to do it. So as I've moved into the collegiate setting, um, because we have the revenue gen model, um, initially it was myself and Vicky that were kind of um, the lead faces of that. And we just got too busy with the varsity side. So we had to bring in additional help. And, but it was, uh, it was a big help doing some of the private stuff to start to get that set up and understand what it's like to work with um, an organization or try to get a triple a hockey team on board or something like that. Like that was a, that was a big help initially when we were setting up our, our pricing structures and stuff like that. Um, but just keep taking or keep in mind what the people above you are doing and what you can learn from it, either what to do or what not to do, I think is probably one of the biggest piece of advice I could give. I got a few comments. If anyone's still listening. <laughs> Bring it on, Josh. Um, is, this a, is this a WWE? Like, are you dropping a, what do they call it? Dropping a something? The promo. People, dropping a the, promo. He's the heel. Um, my heel turn would be epic, chaps. I think my heel turn would be epic. Uh, I, I mean, the learning, the, the sort of on-the-job learning in the collegiate sector for me has been tremendous. Obviously, you know, I got to spend some time with Steve as he was sort of launching things and saw the, the back end of that whole system kind of come to fruition as it's evolved from McMaster to Brock and so on, and a lot of people across the country adopting it. Um, but I think when I got here, it was interesting because our athletic department was a bit of a cluster under our, our former AD and um, like I didn't have a budget for two years. Uh, my manager basically told me like, hey, uh, if you want some equipment or something, like just ask and we'll say yes or no. And I was like, oh, I don't really like the. I don't like how that works, but like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of happy to be doing what I'm doing and, and whatever. And so it got to a point where I was like, no, no, I need, I want to be able to strategize. So I just basically, one, one piece of advice for anyone that's coming into a situation that might be like that is advocate for yourself, advocate for yourself, advocate for yourself, advocate for yourself. And you might, you know, you might be de beating a dead horse to say like, Hey, I'm you know, like, I'll put together the budget and, and, uh, and, and present it to you. Um, or just, you know, asking, asking your managers for help. But then what I started to do was lean on the other people within the organization and within our, our department. And so really getting to know people in finance and our finance managers and our, you know, financial assistants. And then all of a sudden they started to help me problem solve some of the things and make my processes easier. So as I'm, you know, as I'm going and doing a, handing in an expense claim to, you know, Kate is her name. You know, and I'm or, or I'm trying to problem solve sort of a, an invoicing issue with our uh, per, uh, performance academy. You know, she's coming up with great ideas about how to how to streamline the process, and so really like sort of um, leaning on people within the organization and and uh, asking great questions and getting to know them. Like to Steve's point earlier, having staff training, like you know, it's a that's a great you know part to place to do that, but. Uh, so that was one thing that I did was really, really get to know uh, all of the people within our department so that, you know, I would, I would try to help them as much as I could. So then at any point um, I could sort of call on them as well. And sometimes, you know, sometimes you're in a, you're in a situation and uh, you're, you're not wrong fully. Uh, sometimes you're, <laughs> you're in a situation, you're like, I don't want to ask for help. You know, like I feel stupid if I'm, you know, asking how to, how to create a budget or, you know, whatever it is. And it's like, no, do it, you know, show, like show some vulnerability in it. And, and, you know, if you have some decent people, half decent people looking at your organization, they're going to be, you know, they're going to be willing to help you, even if they're sort of in that C-suite level that Chaps was talking about, and you might not be sniffing that a whole lot. But um, the other thing too is, you know, I, I very strategically, when I did my master's, it wasn't training related. It was in leadership it's, it's kind of like an MBA without all the math is how I heard someone describe it um, because I wanted to understand 
those things on a different level. And the benefit of that was it connected me with a lot of people from different um, fields. So there was like, you know, uh, medicine. So we had like nurses and administrators from hospitals and, you know, people in policing and Mm -hmm. HR. And so now I have this massive network of people who I can, you know, call on at any point, which I have, which is, I find really helpful. So if there's even people, you know, as family, friends from, you know, from that standpoint, and you might not think, you know, being a, being a strength coach or, or what have you, uh, you know, there's a lot of carryover connection to someone that might be in, you know, that works as a, a hospital administrator, but you might, you, you, you probably end up being pretty surprised. Um, I lean on my brother a lot, actually, he works in a corporate office for a, a hotel chain. And sometimes I'm just like, I, I found out that, he was known as the guy who was really good at difficult conversations in his uh, sort of in his unit. So now I ask him stuff all the time, just like, you know, how, how would you handle this? Because he sits in that sort of corporate world a little bit more than, than I do in the, in the weight room. But those are just some general thoughts. I think oh, the, the, sorry, sorry, Josh, um, cause it's a, it's a similar guy that we worked with. Uh, a, Good way to backbone your vulnerability sometimes too is when those people are aware of the good job that you're doing and what you're actually hired to do. Um, so the finance, I don't even know what his term is now, but the guy that ended up, he, he moved from housing into athletics finance and revamped it all when I was at Guelph. His kid ended up being in one of the junior Griffin programs and I got to talk to him at football practices instead of across the desk with me jacking up a bunch of finance stuff that I didn't know what I was doing. So then you could see, oh, this guy is not a total idiot. Uh, it might be someone that's on staff that has a kid that's in one of your rev gen programs or, you know, they're doing the staff training. Then they see what you have to, to offer. They're not seeing you messing up the things that you have no training in. So then they're, they're more willing to help you. And from that point on with that finance guy, for me, it was like he was, he was doing everything he could for me because he saw that I had value in other areas. And and sometimes that's the easiest way to do it because everyone on here, like everyone on here that I know, they do a good job of what they're supposed to do. The other stuff, it's challenging for us. Yeah. The, um, one of the other things too, and Foley, you, you kind of pushed me a little bit to do this was like insert yourself in every opportunity and situation to sit at tables where people are doing these types of things. And so whether it's a hiring committee, you know, support model committee, um, uh, you know, there's all kinds of committees and maybe you sit, maybe you reach out because there's not a lot of opportunities within your department, but maybe you reach out to some other stuff, and, you know, on campus and see if there's opportunities. You can help into there. Good. Anyway, so you probably saw my comment. So we got to kind of wrap this up. We're at our time. We try not to let these drag any longer because some people will start saying, well, I'm not going to hang in there for the whole time. They'll cut out earlier. So try and shut it down right at 2.30. I thought that was great conversation. Really appreciate everybody contributing to the expertise on this. Uh, shout out for any uh, ideas for future um, shop talks. Uh, we've got more business, we've got more. We're just gonna try and keep it varied and make sure it's stuff that interests at least a handful of us because if it interests a handful of us, usually that means there's a handful more that wanna get involved. So keep staying tuned and then um, watch for the emails from Sam. She's got all these recordings um, posted on YouTube. So you can go to our little YouTube channel and follow along. And don't be afraid to uh, refer a friend, uh, bring them in. And if you have great ideas, send them through. Any other comments, questions? Sam, you good? Thumbs up, anybody? Very good. All right, guys, thanks for coming out. Sam, you can end the recording. We'll see you around. Yeah, thanks guys. We'll see you next week. See you around.